Hi, it's Dr. Mark Fulcher here, and it's my pleasure to join you in this 11 and 11 uh, lecture series. And today I'm, a, I'm joined by Dr. Peter Doge. Uh, Peter is a lower limb sports trauma orthopedic surgeon from the FIFA Medical Center in, in Aspata. He is the chair of the Isikos Foot and Ankle Group uh, and uh, has a real interest in football injuries. So it's my pleasure to, uh, to be joined by Peter today. Hi Mark, uh, pleasure is mine and greetings to the football family. Thanks for joining us Peter. So I understand you're going to talk to us today about syndesmosis injuries. Yes, so the idea is that we talk a little bit on the advances that we now know on, uh, on distal isolated syndesmotic injuries that are out there in, uh, in the soccer fields and uh, that we would like to discuss a little bit on because there's some new highlights coming that came up recently in that regard. Okay, great. So uh, let's get started. Very well. Now, if we uh, discuss whether it's ankle sprains or high ankle sprains, as these injuries are called, um, we have to acknowledge the fact that we, in, compared to ankle sprains, we don't really know a lot about the epidemiology of these distal isolated syndesmotic injuries called high ankle sprains. Mm -hmm. And until recently, because, uh, because of that gap in our knowledge, and if you don't know the extent of it, how can you at least diagnose or treat it properly? So we did an epidemiological study on it uh, with the group of Jan Ekstrand and Bart Lubbers, where we were able to use the UEFA Champions League data that follows in a prospective cohort uh, over 15 seasons now. And we identified 3,677 male professional football players where every month the incidence uh, of, of injuries was uh, noted and sent to the database and uh, in that regard we were able to have very credible and uh, big cohort uh, data on the epidemiology of these high ankle sprains in football. Mm -hmm. Now what did come out of it? It came out that there's this still is a rare type of injury. We have a lot of data on the ankle sprains, we don't have on the high ankle sprains but now we know that it's still a rare injury. We know that it occurs 14 times more in match play compared to training play. And um, we have seen that there's a, an increase season over season over the last 15 uh, football seasons. We've also seen that although you have different gradings, in general, a high ankle sprain never allows a football player return to play before five weeks after injury. So it's quite an uh, injury with an interesting uh, need for rehab and time to return to play. Okay, so uh, it takes a lot longer to recover than a lateral ankle sprain. Exactly. Nice one. So can you tell us a little bit more about how these, uh, these occur? Yes, so when we go to the, to the way towards a diagnosis, um, probably the most important uh, finding in getting your differential diagnosis uh, towards the final diagnosis is to go for uh, the injury mechanism. Luckily, many of us uh, are on the bench or are seeing the videos nowadays where there's direct access to a lot of video footage on training and, and match play. And the mechanism is crucial in this regard because where you have an ankle sprain that always has or predominantly has the inversion mechanism, the high ankle sprain, and the one we talk about now, is not at all related to an inversion mechanism. It's related to an external rotation mechanism, as you can see on the left photo, where or the foot goes in dorsiflexion or plantar flexion, but it's really a rotatory injury mechanism uh, that is not to be compared with an inversion. So if your athlete says, I really inverted my ankle, the chance of high ankle sprain becomes much less. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And then you have, of course, the pain areas where the athlete uh, shows that the pain is not so much on the distal uh, lower fibular side, but mainly radiating up a little bit more towards the, 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 tib the tibiofibular area itself. So even the mechanism, but also the pain area is different from a normal ankle sprain. Now, when we jump to a clinical examination, then you can uh, easily access uh, the following uh, tests on, uh, on digital videos out there online. I just highlighted a few of them. Now, none of these tests is patognomonic or 
the diagnosis of a high ankle sprain. But it is very helpful in order to get your idea in your differential diagnosis, whether it's a uh, metatarsal five base, whether it's a sinus tarsi injury, whether it's a peroneal injury, whether it's a normal or call it a lateral ligament sprain, or it's really the distal syndesmosis of which we talk about now. The squeeze test, the external rotation test, fibular translation test, cotton test, and cross leg test are the commonly used tests to get into the picture of having an idea if it's a high ankle sprain, high ankle sprain or not. Great. It might be a good time to remind listeners that uh, these tests are all on video in the ankle diploma page that you've uh, you've authored. So, if you want to learn a little bit more about those tests, that would be a good place to go. That is correct. The diagnosis, of course, nowadays we have access to a lot of imaging, but it's not always that necessary. We now know that um, the comparative weight-bearing X-rays, they have a high specificity, but a low sensitivity. That means that you can use them in your setup, but as with the clinical tests, it's not pathognomonic. So we really need to create a cocktail of, of all the diagnostic potential we have in order to fine tune towards the diagnosis. MRI is, of course, a, a static uh, investigation, but very helpful in identifying the ligaments itself. We are talking basically about four ligaments. You have three ligaments on the lateral side, which are the AITFL, the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, the IOL, the interosseous ligament, and the PITFL, which is the posterior inferior talofibular ligament. These are the three lateral ones that we discuss in a syndesmosis. And then we also have to consider the medial side with the deltoid ligament. MRI is, of course, very helpful in identifying whether they're ruptured, whether they're attenuated, chronically hypertrophic or uh, non-existent or perfectly intact. So um, if you don't have access to MRI, but you have access to CT or dynamic ultrasound or, of course, diagnostic arthroscopy, you can use these also. For me, CT is helpful in identifying whether there's congruence between the distal fibula and the distal tibia into the axial way, uh, the axial view on the images to see whether there's diastasis, whether there's more uh, posterior sagging or anterior sagging of the joint itself. Ultrasound can be very helpful, but of course, in an acute stage where there's pain, it's not always easy to, to, to trigger instability with your ultrasound and testing. But in uh, experienced hands, it can be a very helpful tool in identifying at low cost uh, distal syndesmosis instability. And of course, we come to the diagnostic arthroscopy, which is a surgical procedure that, of course, nowadays is less and less used because our imaging and our clinical assessment can be that uh, strong that we don't need it. But I will talk to you about some cases where an arthroscopy can really make the difference. And uh, if there's suspicion on a clinical basis and or a radiological basis, we can proceed to a diagnostic arthroscopy that can identify the problem and meanwhile treat it. So it doesn't always become just a diagnostic, but it can be a therapeutical one also. Um, mentioning that, the X-ray uh, has some uh, tools where you can uh, take some measurements as the tibiofibular clear space, as the medial clear space, as mentioned on this slide. Uh, it is helpful. Again, it's not pathognomonic, but in cases where clear instability occurs, you can really uh, identify already on a simple X-ray whether it's stable or not. Okay. Do you, what would be your standard imaging regime? So if you had a, a player you thought had a syndesmosis injury, what would be your go-to tests? Yes, thanks, Mark. That's a really good question because uh, this is very practical and, uh, and is what we need to do. Now, again, the injury mechanism for me is the most important. If it's external, I will already highlight the fact that it might be syndesmosis. And then you come to a simple X-ray, of course, to see the clear spaces, but uh, mainly to identify other combined comorbidities. Because due to uh, some external rotation injuries, you can have avulsions, you can have stress fractures, and uh, that has to be regarded in your uh, diagnostic setup. For me, simply listen well, uh, do the test, take a simple X-ray, make your mind up, and then identify whether you need to go for more additional imaging like MRI, CT, or ultrasound. So that would be plan, uh, or the next step, not plan B, but the next step. 
Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about these these grades. Now, uh, we like to keep it simple if we can, and I put three simple grades, three simple rules, because that's maybe helpful in, uh, in not just identifying the problem, but also keep it in the back of your mind that you can use it in your uh, initial setup on the pitch or, or in the medical uh, room of the stadium. If you have a uh, suspicion of a syndesmosis sprain, we mainly talk about three grades. The grade one is the is the mild one, where clinically you have some pain, you have a stable joint, the x-rays are fine, and uh, you have some incomplete injury to the lateral ligaments that we encounter a lot in soccer. Um, of course, this grade is a grade that we treat conservatively, and you can see on the right side of the slide some guidelines towards rehabilitation. And let me jump to grade three first. Uh, grade three is an uh, injury where there's a complete injury to the syndesmotic ligament with widening on x-ray and a positive testing, mainly external rotation test and squeeze test. This grade probably always requires surgery. Now, the big issue we have in, in, in football is that approximately uh, about 80% of our injuries are grade twos. And grade twos are the, the tricky ones because there's still a controversy whether uh, or a controversy to know uh, whether it's stable or not. What is a grade two? A grade two shows that there's a partial syndesmotic disruption of the ligament, mainly normal x-rays upon uh, identification, and a positive testing clinically. And then we come um, to the situation where we say, okay, grade one is uh, always conservative, grade three is probably always surgical, but the most commonly encounters is grade two, and there, we remain with some uh, work to do in our setup towards a proper uh, treatment algorithm. And that's why I wanted to choose this uh, title for uh, the talk, because I think there's still some uh, controversy in that. And I wanted to highlight how we uh, tend to treat that and how the world in literature supports that. Okay. So perhaps you so could... Then Talk us through these fairly daunting uh, algorithms. <laughs> Indeed, don't uh, don't let it uh, get you annoyed. Just <laughs> highlight a few things. Now, if you have a suspicion, uh, you first have to identify whether you have a fracture or not, and that's why I say just take an X-ray. Then you already know that. And then you come into the area with fracture or without fracture. Let's talk about the ones without fracture, because the fracture treatment is different. As I said, most commonly you will encounter a grade 2 sprain and then you have to know whether it's stable or not. Now, if you look at literature, uh, literature does not support in grade 2s a specific algorithm to say it's stable or not. But we have a few variables that you can identify to know whether you probably have more stability or probably have more instability. And that's on the left slide. If you have a deltoid ligament injury combined to your high ankle sprain, if you have a positive external rotation test with a positive squeeze test, or if you have tenderness over the interosseous ligament, meaning from the uh, distal part of the anterolateral uh, ankle, all the way radiating up over that fibular area in between tibia and fibula, if you have a suspicion of widened syndesmosis on X-ray. So if you have one of these four, probably you have more chance to have an unstable distal isolated syndesmotic injury and i think that's very helpful because this is data that is has recently come out the last years and i have found that in my personal clinical assessment very helpful in order to know whether you have to uh, transfer towards the surgeon to have to transfer towards the the bracing and uh, and physiotherapist and so on so it's been helpful it's not waterproof but it's been helpful so far excellent so, um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the surgical treatment then? Yes, yeah, so let's not elaborate too much on the technical details. What I just wanted to uh, highlight with this slide is, first of all, the mechanism. As you can see on the photo, this is a tackle from behind on the left uh, ankle where you see a uh, forced dorsiflexion external rotation injury. And uh, the first thing we do in that assessment is, of course, the X-ray, as we have discussed previously. Now, 
it's not always that simple. Uh, you don't need training in radiology to see <laughs> that there's uh, fractures there, that there's cartilage lesions there, that there's diastasis there, that there's avulsions in the ligament there. I just put this slide to show the devastating effects it can have on an ankle in a football player with that forced external rotation injury. Now, when you talk about treating that, this is mainly technically, this is mainly orthopedic work. And what we do is try to realign the joint. All the rest will heal, but the joint needs to be realigned and stable. And that's what we do with our techniques. Eh? We, we try to use some uh, plate and screws to get the fracture fixed. And then we get the distal tibiofibular uh, joint back into place. Whether you use screws or suture buttons, uh, it doesn't matter as long as you get the medial gutter aligned with the uh, talocrural joint line, aligned with the lateral gutter. And that's, in essence, what needs to be dealt with in order to get the player back to the pitch. On the right side, you can see the different techniques, but uh, we've recently also published on that, and uh, I'm uh, inviting you to, uh, to read uh, some papers on it, uh, because nowadays we have clear messages based upon evidence-based uh, guidelines uh, in order for everybody out there to know how to uh, direct a player towards a specific treatment if they ask for information. Great. And Peter, we'll post a link to that paper uh, onto the network after we release the talk. So uh, if you need to find the paper, we should be able to, to find a link for you. So I think you have some surgical images and videos to share. So um, let's move on and have a look at one of those. Yes, so when you are performing a diagnostic arthroscopy, this is what we call a probe test. Imagine you have a grade 2 in your clinical assessment and you say, look, this is football player, high exposure, we need to be sure that we don't lose time, that we don't get into a chronic situation that could have devastating effects anyway. What you can do is send for a diagnostic arthroscopy with this probe test. Now, the probe has about 4.5 millimeter hook. And if you twist the hook into the syndesmosis, you could see that it opened up on external rotation. That is what we call a positive test uh, with the probe. You can also do it with what we call a shaver. And I probably think that is your next slide, Mark. Yeah, mm -hmm. a shaver is a 5.0 um, tool that we uh, use in surgery that if you can put it into the distal syndesmosis, it means it's just too widened. So. It might sound strange that it's hard to identify also during surgery, but with these tests, it can kind of really can help you in identifying instability. By the way, I have no disclosure at all towards any uh, tool used in uh, any video. Very good. Uh, and so I think you have this case to share with us as well and your, your approach to this case. Well, as you asked to, to keep it practical, I think um, we just took some cases from clinic and, uh, and, and want, to, want to share with you uh, how we deal with it from beginning till end. Now, this was a player from the youth uh, minus 21 national team elsewhere that was sent to us with a cast for a mild fracture in his uh, lateral fibula. You can see what we call a Weber B fracture, which is an oblique fracture of the distal fibula over the joint line of the talocrural joint. Now, I agree, this is a well-aligned, not too heavily malrotated uh, fracture of the distal fibula, but I disagree with the fact that a uh, cast would heal his condition. Because for me, and for, of course, the foot and ankle uh, sports traumatologists out there, this is mainly a soft tissue injury photo where there happens to be a fracture also. So if you only treat the fracture with your cast, you probably have uh, not helped your, your football player because there's a complete instability if you look at the photos on the right side. So what we did is say, look, as you can already identify on the X-ray, although it's static and non-weight bearing, you can see there's a widening of that distal syndesmosis. And if you then look into the arthroscopy on the um, on the upper uh, two uh, photos, you can see the lateral ligament. But on the uh, lower, you see the deltoid ligament. And uh, this mainly highlights photos of complete rupture of the distal syndesmosis falling into the joint and the medial uh, ligament torn also. 
As I said, this is a complete floating ligamentous ankle where there happens to be a fracture. So what we do is we, we fix the fracture, we fix the instability, we clean up the impingement that is mainly in the anterolateral side of the ankle. And by doing so, you get uh, your athlete uh, back into a uh, stable ankle position that gives him or her much more chance to uh, get to full return to play. So I think most of the, the uh, people at home will be able to see the work you've done on the, the player's fibula there. Can you talk us through a little bit the, the fixation for the syndesmosis? It's not quite as visible uh, for most of us. Yes, so the fixation of the syndesmosis is mainly uh, reducing the distal fibula into the uh, groove of the distal tibia. And once you have that, you have to make sure it moves. So you have to stabilize, but meanwhile, allow movement, of course. And having said that, there are two typical tools that you can use in order to get it back into position, but also keeping it there. Because a syndesmosis will not give any big problem to a football player upon straightforward running or sprinting, but it will give the problem in rotation, in deceleration, twisting, in curved running. And uh, by uh, stabilizing, um, the distal fibula with the distal tibia, as you can see with a little rope there. I don't know if you can see it on x-ray, Mark, mm -hmm. but there's a little uh, black line from the uh, fibula towards the tibia and then a little piece of uh, metal on the medial side. Well, that's the rope that you use in order uh, to stabilize it, fix it, but allow movement meanwhile. You can also use a screw. Uh, there's two very good treatments for that. In this case, we chose for an, uh, a rope. Excellent. Great case. So, uh, Peter, thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, we're not quite ready to let you go. We, uh, we have a few questions from the network. Uh, but for those of you out there listening uh, that might want to follow Peter or, or learn a little bit more about his work, I'd encourage you to look at his Twitter, logger, uh, Twitter account or uh, follow him on LinkedIn. So, uh, yeah, thanks very much for, for a great talk there, Peter. Pleasure, Mike. Always uh, nice to, to join in, a, in learning and sharing experience one from each other. Okay, and as I said, you're not quite off the hook yet. So um, we do have some questions uh, from the, the medical network, and uh, we'll get straight into those. So this question you, you have asked, um, you've answered probably quite well already, but um, coaches and players, they always want to know how long they're going to be out of sport for. So... Um, Perhaps for the, the sort of lower grade injury, how, how much time would you, you sort of explain to a player that they would likely miss? Yeah, so luckily most of the, the syndesmotic injuries that we encounter are stable injuries. Eh? Um, I would say based upon clear epidemiological data that we described in the beginning, you at least have to count five weeks. Mm -hmm. Now that is for a, a, a grade one injury. You will say that's too long. But it is not a simple ankle sprain. Right? It is much more than that. It's a three-dimensional rotational ligamentous instability that can occur. And the, the worst is that it becomes chronic because most of our treatment algorithms don't really work any, anymore very well for that. And then we have to go to serious surgeries that keep the players longer out. So I would say five weeks is what we see from football data as the common time to return to play. Now, if it's a serious grade two, it might extend towards two months. But I would say between five weeks and two months is what you can expect in the stable, severe syndesmotic injury. Right. Uh, so this is a little bit different. It's not about uh, syndesmosis injuries, but uh, frequently uh, in clinic we'll come across a player who's, who's been diagnosed with an ankle sprain, but they haven't gotten better. So um, what's your approach to a player with those more chronic symptoms, say three, four months after uh, what seems initially to be a simple ankle sprain? Yes, so uh, I, I like uh, the way you put it, uh, and I would re uh, respond with the fact that we call the line, there's no such thing as a simple ankle <laughs> sprain. Now, why do we say that? Because the ankle sprain itself is not too much our concern. Eh? An ankle sprain is the most common injury in the world of sports and the third one in the world of football. So uh, third or fourth now, I heard it's fourth now, so I have to be con uh, clear in that. Now, there's no such thing as a simple ankle sprain because we don't really worry about 
the lateral ligament sprain because there's so much regenerative potential there with bracing, with good physiotherapy, good neuromuscular training, good proprioception, good stabilization. So this works and uh, we don't have to alter that. The big problem is we have to, at all stakes, avoid an ankle sprain to become chronic. Why? Because it's not just the ankle sprain or the, the functional instability that you might encounter in your gameplay. It's mainly the comorbidities, the concomitant injuries that you get by that. And what do I mean by that? Of course, you can have fractures, avulsions, stress fractures. But uh, there's mainly out there what we call cartilage lesions, eh? the, the tailored dome lesions. And we know nowadays, and we have clear data to support that, that chronic ankle instability leads to cartilage lesions into the ankle and impingement syndromes in the ankle, which are basically mechanical soft tissue or bony conflicts into the joint. So to answer the question, how do you approach a player with chronic symptoms? Chronic symptoms have to be avoided at all stakes. And if you have chronic system, uh, symptoms, don't look at the ankle sprain at itself, but look at combined injuries, mainly cartilage and impingement. Good advice. So a final question uh, follows on a little bit, I guess, from that one. So when would you consider offering surgery for someone with a lateral ligament injury? Yes, so I would, I would say there's almost no place for uh, surgery for lateral instability if you have no combined injuries. Uh, of course, it's a bit controversial to say that, but I really believe and I see in a daily clinical practice that lateral instability can be dealt with in a very good way with conservative treatment options. As we spoke by the previous question, uh, it's mainly when there's combined injuries of cartilage and impingement where the surgery comes in and of course, you have the cause and the result. The cause is the instability. The result is that you have combined lesions as cartilage as an impingement. So if you're going to deal with the pain syndromes that were caused by the instability uh, through arthroscopy or open surgery, you have to make sure you also, also treat the cause then, otherwise you have recurrence. So I would say, when do you consider surgery for lateral instability? Mainly if you have the need for surgery for combined lesions for cartilage and impingement, basically. Okay, that sounds like excellent advice. So, uh, Dr. Peter Doge, thank you very much for joining us and sharing your expertise with us. We really appreciate it. A real pleasure, Mark. Great stuff. And so, for those of you listening out there, uh, keep uh, a close eye on the network. We'll be announcing the next 11 and 11 talk uh, soon. And remember, you've got the opportunity to pose questions to the experts by posting to the medical network. Uh, thanks for joining us this uh, today, and uh, we look forward to future talks.